Um, so the topic here is, of course, you can see based on the title, is mast cell activation and how it relates to dysbiosis in common GI disorders. So it turns out that there's quite a bit of recent research in this area uh, that's really shedding a lot of light on uh, the important role of mast cells in common GI disorders. So firstly, I wanna start off with uh, the first slide here. So I just wanna talk a little bit about mast cells and give you kind of a quick reminder for those of you who are already aware of mast cells on uh, some uh, additional information for those who may be less familiar. Um, so mast cells overall are very important immune cells that play diverse roles, uh, mostly in barrier type sites like the skin, uh, the various mucosal sites, especially the GI tract and the respiratory tract. And then also of course in systemic immune responses. Uh, and that's quite relevant to some of the best known disorders related to mast cells, such as mast cell activation syndrome. Um, mast cells can actually be activated by a wide range of factors. Uh, so we tend to think of them as being activated by allergens in particular. And so their role in allergy, anaphylaxis in particular, has been known for a long time uh, and well-defined to be an IgE-mediated type immune response. Uh, but actually there are quite a few different factors. We'll talk a little bit about some of those today. Um, and it's partly due to the fact that mast cells actually contain in their cell surface a pretty large diversity of different receptors that can detect various factors. So factors that are produced by microbes, for example, uh, chemicals, uh, and many other factors that can be detected by mast cells, and that induces a range of responses. Uh, so they can produce a pretty long list of mediators. We'll talk more about that momentarily. Uh, so it's, it's really a more complex picture that's been emerging about mast cells. Uh, and so they play a really critical role in sort of detecting what's going on in the gut environment, the respiratory environment, and in the skin, and then translating that and influencing the rest of the immune responses. Uh, so again, really critical roles in the immune response. Uh, to various factors. Uh, but of course, so that's just sort of in its normal role, but of course when things are out of balance and there's an abnormal, excessive, or prolonged type reactivity of mast cells uh, where they're chronically activated, that of course can contribute to a pretty long list of conditions. So among the best known uh, tend to be mastocytosis. Uh, so that's generally characterized as a pretty severe disorder with very significant symptoms for a lot of patients. Uh, then there's mast cell activation syndrome, uh, which has a very wide range in terms of severity and presentation. Some patients may have mild symptoms, other patients may have very significant symptoms. Uh, and again, there's also quite a few different types of respiratory and skin conditions, uh, conditions such as eczema, um, atopic dermatitis, for example, uh, and also allergic rhinitis uh, and seasonal allergies uh, when it comes to the respiratory tract. Of course, today we're gonna to focus on the GI disorder aspect of mast cells, which traditionally has been less well-researched, less known. Uh, so really what we're gonna to do today is focus in the first half of the webinar on a lot of the new research that has been emerging in the last few years that sheds a lot of light on the important role that mast cells play in, gut, in the gut in terms of symptoms, as well as various disorders. Now, this is a great uh, sort of review article, summary article, uh, that I would encourage everyone to check out if you have a chance. Uh, this just came out recently last year. Uh, it's titled Mast Cell Activation Syndrome, a Primer for the Gastroenterologist. So some of the information I'm gonna present here uh, momentarily is from this review article. Uh, so this is an excerpt from the article where they say mast cells are multifunctional immune cells which play critical roles in innate and adaptive immunity. Uh, they go on to say that mast cells react to various allergens, tissue trauma, i.e. tissue damage, uh, and infection, and quickly respond by releasing various biologically active mediators. Uh, and in fact, they say that uh, as far as is known so far, um, over 200 of these mediators have been identified. And they include groups of mediators called biogenic amines. Uh, of course, the classic one that we're probably all familiar with is histamine, uh, but they can produce other biogenic amines uh, that have various effects. Various proteases, uh, particularly tryptase, so that's kind of one of the classic uh, mediators that is produced um, by the mast cells. Uh, tryptase has many different effects as well, including uh, possibly promoting inflammation in certain scenarios. 
Uh, also, they can produce various cytokines, and that, that plays a really critical role in helping to define what the overall immune response is going to be in response to whatever the mast cell is detecting. Um, there are various other mediators as well uh, in the group of prostaglandins and leukotrienes that also play really important roles uh, in immune function. Um, interestingly, though, we tend to think of mast cells in sort of their classic sense, uh, but they do play different roles in different scenarios, depending on the local environmental conditions, et cetera. So they say here, the specific profile of the mediator. So of course, they don't necessarily produce all 200 mediators at once, uh, but the ones that they do produce uh, really is driven in part by the, the subtype of the mast cell. Uh, and then also the local environment, uh, wherever the, the cell is located, whether it's in the respiratory tract, in the skin, et cetera. So they can really be very dynamic type cells that again play very wide roles in immune function. Um, also from the same article, uh, this is a table that lists the various uh, sort of organ systems around the body. Uh, so we know that mast cells can produce a very diverse range of symptoms uh, and many different organism, organs sometimes at the same time, uh, and that can be part of the mast cell activation syndrome. Uh, so I just highlighted here within the GI tract, uh, they're definitely well defined as having roles in certain esophageal symptoms and conditions, and they list here heartburn, dysphagia, and a few others. Uh, also in the stomach, uh, they may play a role in dyspepsia. And then in the small and large intestine, they're largely related to common symptoms such as abdominal pain, discomfort, diarrhea, and constipation. Um, so uh, in terms of assessing common conditions like IBS, obviously these symptoms overlap quite a bit with IBS. Uh, so there's sort of the, the challenge that clinicians have when they're faced with patients that have these common symptoms uh, is, you know, what is the underlying factors that are coming into play? What's the diagnosis? So IBS often is part of that picture. Um, and some clinicians uh, definitely focus on uh, whether or not there, there may be other conditions that can lead to those same kinds of symptoms, such as mast cell activation. Uh, but as we're gonna see here, as we go through the different uh, types of research uh, that address the role of mast cells in the gut, uh, that they can certainly play an underlying role in common conditions like IBS. So they may not be a separate condition that just mimics IBS, but mast cell activation may occur actually as one of the mechanisms in IBS. Now, this is just a list, again, from the same article of common symptoms uh, in the GI tract that are often associated with mast cell activation syndrome. Uh, and this is based on the frequency that they're reported by patients. Uh, so commonly, patients often have nausea and sometimes vomiting. Um, heartburn is fairly common, again, abdominal pain sometimes chest pain, also alternating diarrhea and constipation, which of course is one of the also classic features of IBS, um, and many other things as well, such as esophageal symptoms, uh, oral symptoms, et cetera. Uh, so a fairly long list of very common GI symptoms that may be attributed in part to these mast cells that are activated in the gut. Uh, so this is a figure from a review article a few years ago addressing the key role of mast cells in immune responses to pathogens. So this is a relatively recently recognized role for these mast cells, uh, that they do play a big role overall in response to pathogens and even to just uh, dysbiosis, so imbalances in common microbes. So I'm gonna go ahead and enlarge this so you can see it a little bit better. Um, so you can see the mast cell here in the center. And sort of the classic trigger for mast cells, they have these receptors that then uh, are attached to the immunoglobulin E, uh, immunoglobulins, um, and those can recognize uh, particularly food antigens, but also other types of antigens. So for example, in food allergy, uh, this is one of the main uh, phenomena that happens with food allergy is that the antigen can bind to this IgE molecule that you can see here in the center um, that's basically attached to the mast cell. And then that initiates the release of these various mediators and other responses by the mast cells. And then essentially from there, you can see all these different branches coming out where they can affect uh, B cells and T cells, so adaptive immunity. Uh, if you go over towards the upper left, um, they can affect uh, the endothelial cells that line the blood vessels, uh, and that's part of what can cause vascular permeability. Uh, so that can lead to swelling, for example, 
Uh, and also in the gut, that can lead to additional fluid getting into the gut and may contribute to bloating. Um, further to the left are neutrophils, and those are key cells that are involved in antipathogen activity. Also dendritic cells and macrophages play a big role in detecting and responding to pathogens. Uh, then you can see here in the bottom uh, right, the epithelial cells, uh, and that can stimulate, the mediators from mast cells can stimulate uh, cytokines produced by the epithelial cells. Uh, they can further magnify an immune response. Also mucus production. Uh, and then it's not really shown here, but also mast cells are widely recognized as contributing to leaky gut. So that can basically cause these gaps between the cells to become wider. And again, that can also lead to increased fluid um, and kind of goes both directions. You can have antigens that cross in uh, from the lumen and that can further stimulate an immune response. Uh, but you can also have uh, fluid leakage out into the lumen that again might contribute to uh, symptoms of bloating. Uh, and then especially with regard to symptoms that are uh, similar to IBS or part of IBS, these mediators, as you can see off to the right, also have effects on smooth muscle cells uh, that can affect uh, motility in the colon and also the small intestine, and also uh, can have effects on nerve cells. Uh, so, so, of course, that can lead to one of the other classic symptoms of IBS potentially, which is visceral hypersensitivity. Uh, just more broadly, mast cells are thought to play a pretty important role overall in pain perception. So again, some very important functions uh, that can all be stimulated by mast cell activation. And again, the classic scenario is when that interaction, the activation is stimulated by binding to an antigen, especially uh, food antigens. So in terms of common uh, mast cell disorders, disorders where they're associated or known to have a cause or role, uh, you can really think of those as in sort of two main categories. Uh, so we have the functional gastrointestinal disorders. The two main ones, uh, two most common ones, are irritable bowel syndrome, or IBS, and then also functional dyspepsia. Uh, of course, adverse food reactions can be another way in which mast cells help to promote symptoms, uh, particularly in food allergies. That's one of the best defined uh, sort of classic uh, interactions with mast cells. Uh, but also food sensitivities and then uh, some types of food intolerances. Uh, so we'll touch on those during this webinar as well. Uh, so just a few more examples of these links between mast cells and these functional, common functional gastrointestinal disorders. Uh, so the title here is the emerging role of mast cells in irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, just to kind of cut to their, their main conclusion here, they say for more than a decade, and with particular respect to IBS, compelling evidence has shown that mast cells may be involved in the generation of IBS symptoms, particularly visceral hypersensitivity. Um, so there's been a growing amount of evidence for a role for mast cells in these functional GI disorders. Uh, and one of those key studies uh, just came out recently in 2021, uh, earlier this year, that shows a possible link uh, between those um, dietary triggers and then IBS type symptoms. Uh, so we'll get to that momentarily, but it's essentially this scenario where it's been sort of growing in terms of the suspicion that mast cells play a significant role, uh, but now we have even more concrete evidence for a specific mechanism for how that can happen. Uh, here's another example uh, just published uh, a month ago in September. Irritable bowel syndrome is strongly associated with the primary and idiopathic mast cell disorders. And they say mounting evidence supports a mechanistic association between IBS and mast cell hyperactivity. Well, so again, really a growing amount of evidence here uh, implicating mast cells as part of uh, the underlying IBS pathophysiology or underlying mechanisms. Uh, one thing I wanted to note here is, so uh, from a diagnostic standpoint, officially IBS is defined by a set of symptoms. So it's a symptom-based diagnosis, not a mechanistic or pathophysiology-based diagnosis. And those are based on what are called uh, the Rome 4 criteria. Uh, and one of the key features, key criteria for diagnosing IBS is visceral hypersensitivity. Uh, so that's certainly a way in which mast cells likely play a key role, at least for some patients that have IBS. 
Um, here's another great review article. Uh, this is called The Role of Mast Cells in Functional GI Disorders. And you can see based on the reference at the top, this is published just a few years ago, and this is sort of the state of knowledge at that point. Uh, since then, there are some additional key studies that have come out. Uh, but I just want to talk about some of the key information in this article because it sort of sets the stage for what we know about the roles of mast cells in uh, these common GI disorders. Uh, this is a table from that review article, and it lists some of the key mediators here in this table off to the left. So you can see things like histamine, uh, tryptase, serotonin, one of the neurotransmitters is actually produced by mast cells. Uh, also, as I mentioned, various types of prostaglandins, with this one in particular, PGV2, possibly playing an important role. Um, and these uh, interact with various types of receptors in most cases. So when it comes to histamine, there are actually four different types of receptors uh, that are known. Uh, several of them are expressed in the gut uh, and may have somewhat different effects depending on the receptor, uh, but definitely shows how histamine likely plays a key role in IBS or IBS-related symptoms. Uh, so you can see in the next column, there's the IBS uh, type, subtype, such as constipation dominant or diarrhea dominant. Uh, and you can see here uh, just a couple examples at the top for histamine. Um, histamine can actually play a role potentially in both types, both dominant types. So IBS constipation, IBS diarrhea, uh, and then in some cases IBS mixed as well. And this lists the various types of effects that they had in the various uh, research model systems. Uh, so overall, this is really, I think, a key concept here in terms of how these mediators uh, can interact with our cells, um, immune cells and other cells in the body, especially in the GI tract, that can lead to potentially some of these uh, symptoms related to different types of IBS. Uh, so this next uh, slide here uh, is titled Factors and Mechanisms uh, Underlying Mast Cell Activation in the Gut. Um, so they list here that there are among the, the many factors that have been studied in relation to how mast cells, uh, mast cell activation may be affecting uh, symptoms or producing symptoms in the gut. Uh, we certainly know that there is a role for infections. Uh, so there's sort of a commonly recognized phenomenon that uh, sub, sub portion or subset of IBS patients um, actually have had a history of uh, things like gastroenteritis, food poisoning, et cetera. Uh, so that can be a subtype of IBS called post-infectious IBS, and then also functional dyspepsia as well. So they say here, infectious gastroenteritis is associated with an increased risk for functional dyspepsia and also IBS. Uh, they go on to say that basically mast cells normally play a role uh, in uh, typical sort of homeostatic immune responses uh, to a number of bacterial, parasitic, viral, and fungal pathogens. Uh, so really they play a critical role in dealing with pathogen infections uh, and also uh, to some extent in dysbiosis. Uh, so it's thought that these infections may help trigger mast cell activation that can have long-term consequences. Uh, we'll uh, talk about that a bit more in a second. Uh, as far as the role of stress, that's widely recognized in terms of a trigger for mast cell activation. There are various factors produced during a stress response, um, such as cortico tropin releasing hormone, which they mention here, the CRF. Uh, and so these, through these various ways, stress can potentially trigger mast cell activation as well. And that's also sort of a widely recognized feature of IBS that often stress uh, tends to be one of the triggers or factors that can exacerbate IBS type symptoms. Um, in particular, we're gonna focus here on the food antigens as a trigger. Uh, so they say here, the majority of patients with functional GI disorders consider their symptoms to be related to meals. For example, more than 60% of patients with IBS report the onset or worsening of symptoms after meals. Within 15 minutes, about 28%, almost 30% uh, have symptoms after consuming a meal. And then uh, within three hours, 93% of IBS patients report that they have symptoms. So this is an, another factor or feature of IBS that has long been recognized that a lot of the symptoms tend to be triggered in response to meals, implying that in general, uh, food components or uh, possibly just the process of, of eating may trigger the symptoms. 
Um, interestingly though, uh, when you look at classical food allergy, sort of the classical IgE mediated food allergy, uh, they say here that food allergy has not been convincingly associated with functional GI disorders. Uh, so that sort of indicates that there are these food reactions, uh, but they don't seem to indicate an involvement of these classic food allergies. Um, they also say of note adverse food reactions, uh, including some types of food intolerance may occur through an IgG mediated sensitization. So more of the food sensitivity type scenario, uh, but also a role for these IgG mediated uh, immune re reactions also remains to be established. So, uh, so even though we know for a long time that there are these food triggered symptoms, uh, the two sort of main known mechanisms through classic IgE food allergy and IgG mediated food sensitivities so far don't have a lot of evidence supporting that they play a role. And as we'll see later, there's actually a third type potentially uh, that may actually play a role. This is also from that same review article. Uh, and it's basically illustrating how nerve cells can interact with various types of nerve endings uh, to contribute potentially to some symptoms. So the key interaction here, as you can see here, the red arrow is pointing to this uh, receptor. Um, so basically the IgE binds to the mast cell. Uh, and then when an antigen comes along, when it encounters an antigen, again, that stimulates mast cell activation and then release of these mediators. So that's sort of the classic, classically recognized mechanism often implicated in food allergies. Uh, so then, of course, those mediators uh, can interact with a lot of different cell types, immune cells, et cetera, uh, but especially nerve cells can play an important role in common GI disorders. So you can see here that this interaction can lead to increased visceral hypersensitivity or pain perception, again, which is a uh, required feature for diagnosis of IBS, so definitely a common symptom. Um, also note here that this mast cell has other receptors. They're only representing just a tiny subset of the total. Uh, you can see also mast cells have these IgG molecules that can also recognize antigens. Um, also something called a TLR, they're different types, uh, but they tend to recognize different types of microbes, uh, both normal and pathogenic, and then other types of receptors. So depending on the type of receptor that's stimulated and what's stimulating it, that can modify the type of results. Uh, in the effects that you have with act mast cell activation. So this is really, I think, a very, very important article. It was published in an important journal. One of the top journals in science uh, was published in Nature earlier this year. Uh, and this title is Local Immune Response to Food Antigens Drives Meal-Induced Abdominal Pain. Uh, so this may be one of the key mechanisms uh, whereby food antigens can actually produce common symptoms, especially those that are characteristic of IBS. So in this article, they uh, basically uh, say a few things here that I wanna make sure that I highlight. Um, so at the top, you can see here that they say, we provide evidence that local IG, IgG, IgE antibodies are involved in food-induced abdominal pain. Uh, they mentioned that specific IgE antibodies were detectable only in this case in colonic tissue, uh, indicating that local rather than systemic immune response to dietary antigens. Uh, so they make the point here that uh, there's a previously unrecognized, more localized type of IgE response that's not really um, characterized in the same way as the classic IgE uh, type allergy. Um, so you won't necessarily detect IgE antibodies in serum, for example, they're localized to the GI tract. Um, so based on their uh, study, which also included uh, research that looked at um, how pathogens may trigger this whole process. Uh, so we'll talk about that momentarily, uh, but they basically go on to say that based on our data, we propose that IBS, at least in an immunogenetically susceptible subgroup of patients, is part of a spectrum of food-induced disorders mediated by mast cell activation with systemic food allergy at the extreme end of the, the spectrum. So I think this is a really key concept. Uh, again, this is just an initial study. Um, so we uh, hopefully we'll be seeing more study to studies to look at this particular mechanism and support it further, but uh, this really kind of fills in a gap. So we've noted again that over the years that foods can be a trigger for IBS symptoms for many patients, the classic food allergies and also the IgG mediated 
food sensitivities didn't seem to play a role, at least based on research so far. Uh, whereas this study uncovered sort of a mechanism in between where there is potentially a type of IgE response that's more localized to the GI tract and may result in GI-dominated uh, symptoms. So again, a really interesting study. Uh, and I think this is probably one of the key mechanisms uh, that may connect mast cells to IBS type symptoms. Uh, so this is from a related article where they were basically just sort of summarizing the results of that primary research article uh, titled Food for Thought about the immune drivers of gut pain. Uh, and they had a nice visual here sort of summarizing their findings. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and expand that here. So essentially, you can see on the left, uh, um, under A, they talk about the initial infection. So this is thought to be one of the ways in which this whole hypersensitivity uh, to food antigens that can stimulate IBS-like symptoms uh, may be initiated. Um, so of course, this fits within the general recognition that a lot of IBS uh, patients may have initiated symptoms based on an initial infection. Uh, so in this model, they looked at infection with a pathogen, and that's in red here. Um, during the infection, of course, the infection can cause leaky gut, can cause inflammation, uh, and that can allow other molecules, so food molecules, for example, to get through and then stimulate an immune response. So kind of a side effect of that initial infection can be the sensitivity development uh, to um, common GI disorders. Uh, so here we can see there's a mast cell indicated here. Um, just note that mast cells can also react more generally, uh, for example, to pathogens and dysbiosis. Uh, so mast cells can still be activated to some extent, uh, even not through an antigen-stimulated mechanism. Uh, but essentially through this process, then we get to the second part here, uh, which is where you can see this is after the infection, uh, where now the mast cells have been sensitized, so they now have these IgE molecules, and that's in the center. It's this blue cell uh, in the center, uh, where essentially these mast cells are ready to react now that they have this IgE that's specific to that food antigen uh, that they developed a sensitivity to. Uh, so then what's thought to happen then is when that food is next ingested, uh, so essentially the same food that was uh, consumed around the time of the infection, uh, where the immune system developed a sensitivity to it, that can stimulate mast cells then to uh, essentially activate and release their granules. Mast cells typically uh, are located in the gut near the nerve endings, uh, so they can have a lot of effects by releasing these mediators, and then those mediators can have effects on the nearby neurons, and that can lead to gut pain. So again, this is thought to be possibly one of the key mechanisms for how foods can stimulate visceral hypersensitivity in patients with uh, disorders like IBS. Interestingly, they also noted that some of the patients had um, higher levels of Staph aureus. Uh, so they say here uh, that Staph aureus is well known to produce something called super antigens. And they say here those are potent antigens that have been linked to nonspecific activation of immune cells called T cells. Well, those T cells are involved in food sensitivity and uh, food allergies as well. So they say, indeed, 47% of fecal samples from people with IBS were positive for at least one super antigen, uh, compared to only 17% of such samples from healthy volunteers. So they say these findings might suggest that previous infection plus the presence of super antigens from Staph aureus together can promote enhanced gut pain in some people with IBS by priming their immune system response. Uh, so again, very, very interesting insights from this recent study um, and definitely also implicates not only pathogenic infections, uh, such as food poisoning, et cetera, but also some of the common opportunists that we see in the gut, such as Staph aureus. A little bit more about Staph aureus before we actually dive into a case example. Uh, so Staph aureus actually has been associated with mast cell activation for quite a while, uh, and especially in the context of skin conditions, again, like eczema and atopic dermatitis, also respiratory conditions such as seasonal allergies, and then in the gut, also to food allergies. So already there is a known link uh, here through research in recent years uh, between mast cells and staph. 
And again, it's thought that part of that, or even a major part of that, may be due to the production of these super antigens by Staph aureus. Uh, so this is a review article that just addresses uh, the overall potential role of these super antigens and the supporting evidence in allergy. Uh, another review article here is titled Responses of Mast Cells to Pathogens, Beneficial and Detrimental Roles. So again, we already talked about the role of mast cells in uh, being one of the important types of cells that helps to control pathogens, counteract pathogens, uh, but also dysbiosis. But of course, chronic activation when that response is out of balance, then that potentially can lead to chronic issues. Interestingly, some of the known microbes that were identified as stimulating mast cell responses are once again Staph aureus, uh, but also some Streptococcus species, which can also produce superantigens. Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which we commonly see on the GI map test, uh, especially in the context of patients that have known food reactions, uh, Enterococcus fecalis, uh, Candida and also H. pylori. So all of these have been documented as potentially having uh, effects in stimulating mast cells. So they may play roles uh, in some cases uh, for patients that have uh, common mast cell or IBS type symptoms. Um, and just a side note is on GMAP, uh, we do have a commonly recognized dysbiosis pattern, a general overgrowth pattern that's often related to poor digestion as well as these common symptoms. And many of these organisms are commonly elevated in that type of pattern. So again, suggesting that uh, what we're seeing with patients that have these common symptoms uh, on the GI map with these being elevated may be quite relevant for insights into mast cell uh, roles in those symptoms. So just a quick summary here, some of the take home messages. Uh, so I covered a lot of information here. I just want to give you some of the background and some of the latest information to set the stage for going through the case example. Uh, so basically, the research summary, uh, I would emphasize two things. One is that GI infections and in mast cells may play a role in food-triggered symptoms in patients with functional GI disorders, and that's thought to be via these localized IgE responses that don't necessarily or aren't necessarily detected in the standard uh, serum-based allergy tests. Uh, dysbiosis, uh, for example, with Staph aureus overgrowth may actually prime mast cell activation, which can further promote these antigen-triggered symptoms. All right, so with that background information, I want to just kind of dive in here. We're going to go in depth into this particular case and sort of really parse it out in terms of uh, the symptoms plus what we're seeing with the results on GI map and how that relates to what we know from these research studies. And then, of course, ultimately how that can be related uh, to mast cell activation. So in this case, this was a 54-year-old male uh, who had, had long-term chronic constipation, uh, also presented with ex excessive bloating and belching after meals. Uh, this is kind of a key observation here, typically within 30 to 60 minutes. Uh, so a fairly quick response after consuming certain foods. Um, so that's often a clue that mast cells may be part of the picture, uh, at least when the mast cell activation occurs in the upper GI tract. Um, the practitioner uh, suspected SIBO, but breath testing was actually negative. So SIBO was ruled out based, based on the breath test. Uh, this patient was still treated with rifaximin, uh, which didn't really have the desired results, and then multiple rounds of herbal anti antimicrobials. Uh, so that's a fairly common scenario when patients have SIBO-like symptoms, is to go down the, the path of uh, SIBO-type treatment. But as we all know, in many cases, sometimes that treatment is not fully effective or patients may relapse. Uh, this patient in particular had variable responses after treatments, some better than others, uh, but always ended up relapsing back to the same symptoms. So when we looked at the GMAP results, uh, just note that C. diff uh, toxin genes were present. Um, most cases of C. diff um, that are detected are asymptomatic, so patients tend to be just be carriers and not necessarily have any significant symptoms due to C. diff. Only a subset uh, seem to have significant symptoms. So um, in most cases, not necessarily related directly to symptoms, uh, but often can still give us some clues that there's likely imbalances in the gut, often having to do with poor digestion, uh, which we actually covered recently in a separate webinar, so I won't talk about that today. <clears throat> then uh, also looking further down the pathogen page, we didn't see any parasites or viruses detected. Uh, 
Uh, as far as H pylori was just below the cutoff of 1.0 E3 uh, at the level of 9.0 E2. And that's within a range where some patients may actually have significant symptoms due to H. pylori, uh, but technically it is below the cutoff, so generally less likely. Uh, but again, may play a role in symptoms. Uh, the most common effect of H. pylori tends to be in contributing to low stomach acid. And of course, that can be part of a lower digestion, reduced digestion type picture. Under the normal bacteria section, we can see that there are some that are elevated, the Clostridia, Enterobacter, Bacteroides, and Formicides. Especially notable are the phyla, Bacteroides and Formicides. Since both of those are elevated, they both together make up 90 to 95 percent of the microbiome. So that's telling us that overall in the colon, these are colon groups primarily, that there's an excess amount of bacteria uh, in the colon. And then Clostridia is part of the Formicides phylum. Uh, so just note that we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but we often do see that in patients that have uh, common GI symptoms such as excess bloating and gas. Uh, also note is the Fecalibacterium prasnitsi, an important butyrate producer, was not detected. It was below the, the detection limit. <clears throat> so we will talk about that momentarily as well. Uh, this is really where we're going to talk a lot about um, how the dysbiosis patterns may be related to uh, mast cell activation. And this is in the opportunistic bacteria section. Um, so we can see here the bacillus is elevated, uh, Morganella is high, uh, also Staphylococcus aureus is detected at a high level. Note specifically that the E4 is about almost 100 fold higher than the cutoff level. So a pretty high level for Staph aureus. Also strep is elevated. Uh, also we see that com commonly elevated with low stomach acid. And then the methane producers are also elevated. Uh, so we'll come back to how these may be related to the patient's symptoms momentarily. Under autoimmune triggers, we can see that Prevotella was just slightly elevated, so not, not very notable, just barely over the limit, uh, often correlates with reduced digestion and or a high carbohydrate diet. No fungi or yeast, no viruses, and then no parasites, no worms. Uh, the intestinal health section actually looked pretty good. Uh, nothing was officially flagged as high or low. Uh, the last days was trending a little bit towards the low normal, and we consider optimal to be roughly around 500 and above. Um, but overall, um, surprisingly, given all the dysbiosis and the symptoms, uh, this section did not look too bad for this patient. So as a summary in terms of the findings on GMAP, uh, C. diff was detected, but this patient was basically asymptomatic for the classic C. diff symptoms. H. pylori was detected just below the cutoff, so it might play a minor to moderate role, especially in lowering stomach acid. Uh, in the normal bacteria section, a bit of a mix, overgrowth plus uh, a low fecalibacterium. Uh, in terms of the opportunistic microbes, a general overgrowth pattern again, uh, including methanogens, organella, and staph aureus, which um, often are among the most clinically relevant All right, so let's go ahead and start to parse this out. So in terms of the chronic constipation uh, symptom, um, there are a couple different uh, microbes on GMAP that may be related uh, in terms of uh, stimulating certain processes or being involved in certain processes that might lead to constipation. Uh, so one, of course, may be mast cell activation. We saw earlier in the introductory information that some of the mediators can promote uh, either constipation or diarrhea, uh, depending on their effects uh, on things like motility, uh, secretion, um, et cetera. So they say here, constipation is a common problem for MCAS patients. When mast cells are located uh, within the muscular layers of the GI tract, they can contribute to the development of GI dysmotility. Um, they go on to say, investigators demonstrated that those with severe constipation had significantly higher numbers of mast cells, and there were, uh, there were de degranulated mast cells close to the enteric glial cells and filaments in patients. So not only were they higher, but they were located close to uh, the cells that can stimulate a ner nerve-type response. 
So note here in the opportunistic bacteria section that, of course, Staph aureus was high, and we know that there can be a link between Staph aureus uh, and also uh, mast cell activation. So that may be one of the contributors. We often do see Staph aureus elevated in patients that have either diarrhea or uh, chronic constipation dominant uh, type IBS. Um, also note that the methane producers are high. We certainly know that methane has also been linked to constipation. Um, so I think this is an important insight here into some of the complications that we often encounter clinically uh, where patients present with uh, constipation, chronic constipation, uh, say on a breath test, um, higher methane is detected, which is indicating, of course, potential overgrowth of the methanogens. So that may be a contributor. Uh, but for some cases, uh, when those methanogens are treated, uh, and I think it's widely recognized that methane uh, uh, positive type SIBO um, can be very challenging to, uh, to address with antimicrobials, et cetera. Um, that there may be other factors that are coming into play as well. Uh, so one aspect contributing to constipation might be addressed by those protocols, uh, and yet there can be others as well. So uh, certainly worth considering mast cell activation when there are some indicators suggesting that that may be the case. Another key um, uh, sort of symptom that we want to parse here is that the symptoms of excessive bloating and belching happened uh, pretty rapidly after the meal, within 30 uh, to 60 minutes. Um, that's addressed here, uh, as we noted earlier that, uh, so this is from one of the review articles, um, but they talk about food antigens as triggers for mast cell activation. Uh, the majority of patients with functional GI disorders consider symptoms to be related to meals. For example, more than 60% of patients with IBS report the onset or worsening of symptoms after meals, within 15 minutes, and then within three hours, 93%. Uh, so that, again, can sometimes be a clue uh, based on the timing of the development of symptoms after meals uh, that possibly mast cell activation may be part of that picture, uh, at least in the upper GI tract. Um, also note here that, uh, so we already talked about Staph aureus and that that can be linked to mast cell activation, also has been linked to food sensitivities and food allergies. Uh, so we do see that quite often in patients that have known food allergies and food sensitivities. Pseudomonas has also been linked to uh, food allergies and food sensitivities. And so oftentimes we'll see both of those present and one or both of those elevated in patients that have food sensitivities and food allergies. Uh, and there are some links in research between pseudomonas and activation of mast cells. Uh, it is one of the types of organisms that we noted earlier uh, from one of the research review articles that can stimulate mast cells. And now I wanna talk about Morganella, which we also often see in patients that have common GI symptoms, especially those um, that are considered to be IBS or IBS-like. Um, so just uh, another uh, snippet from a review article. They say here uh, in this review article on histamine intolerance that uh, certain species, including Morganella morganii and Klebsiella pneumoniae, have been identified as some of the most prolific histamine-forming bacteria. Um, so, of course, the symptoms of histamine intolerance uh, tend to overlap quite a, quite a bit with. Um, excuse me, just going to take a drink of water. Quite a bit with um, histamine intolerance and mast cell activation, and also overlap quite a bit with IBS. Uh, so, you can see here in terms of the many symptoms systemically that uh, histamine intolerance can lead to. Uh, we do see that in the GI tract that uh, common symptoms like bloating, gas, diarrhea, abdominal pain, and constipation uh, can also be part of the histamine intolerance picture. Uh, so definitely can be very challenging for clinicians to sort of parse out what's going on when patients have these common uh, type symptoms uh, because it may represent histamine issues, mast cell issues, uh, IBS uh, type scenario, et cetera. Uh, so there's a growing recognition that histamine also has been associated with functional GI disorders. And that's summarized in this review article. Um, just wanna iterate here, reiterate here from this mast cell activation syndrome uh, review article, um, some of the information related to histamine. So they say here, high histamine foods can activate mast cells in the gut, causing direct and systemic symptoms. The aberrant mast cells and normal mast cells not only release histamine, but the mast cells have receptors for histamine, 
which then activate other mast cells and other cells in the body. So this is a really important statement, and this has uh, come out from recent research <clears throat> looking at the various histamine receptors that are on the surface of mast cells. So not only do mast cells produce histamine, which is, of course, how one of the key ways in which mast cells can uh, produce symptoms, but at the same time, increased histamine uh, in the surrounding local environment near mast cells uh, may also then activate mast cells. So again, kind of amplify that response. They go on to say that high histamine foods can release histamine, which binds to mucosal mast cell receptors on both the aberrant and the normal mast cells. Um, they also found that investigations of the effect of low FODMAP diets and uh, diarrhea dominant IBS patients have shown reduction in plasma histamine levels. Uh, so essentially, um, it's not really clear why or how, but low FODMAP diet, one of the ways in which it may help to improve symptoms is actually by reducing histamine. Uh, so they say, furthermore, high FODMAP diet in mice results in an increased visceral hypersensitivity and increased mast cell density in the colon. Uh, so again, the, the whole picture has really uh, become very interesting with this new research emerging uh, that links mast cells, histamine, and then IBS-like uh, symptoms. It looks like the lines here uh, kind of got out of kilter here, but um, this was meant to highlight the second bullet point, practitioner suspected SIBO, their breath testing was negative. Uh, so again, that's a very common scenario when patients present with these symptoms, um, even though there are many conditions that can lead to those common symptoms. Uh, practitioners often initially start with the assumption that SIBO may be part of the picture and then uh, may proceed to do a uh, breath test to uh, see whether that's actually the case. Um, but typically, we think of SIBO as involving excess production of gases, such as hydrogen, methane, or hydrogen sulfide. And it turns out that for patients that have those types of symptoms, um, may or may not have had uh, excess gas production um, on breath testing. In some cases, of course, that can be in the small intestine, uh, but we know that the main site of gas production is in the colon. <clears throat> so it turns out in those scenarios, we often see that clostridia are elevated along with especially the two phyla. Uh, so let's go into that a little bit more in depth here. Um, so recent research shows that uh, according to this article here, hydrogen metabolism is widespread and diverse among human uh, colonic microbes. Uh, they go on to say the predominant mechanism for H2 production in this ecosystem is through increased fermentation mediated by bacteroidetes and the clostridial members of the firmicutes. Um, so this is a scenario that we do see commonly in patients that have common symptoms like abdominal distension, bloating, excess gas production. They often have an increase in one or both of the phyla uh, and other normal bacteria in the colon. Uh, and this is, uh, again, uh, just the details of that study where they looked at low versus high FODMAP diet. Um, that diet in this study led to only a minor decrease in hydrogen production, but actually resulted in an eight-fold reduction in uh, histamine through the low FODMAP diet. Uh, so again, really interesting connections between this increased fermentation in the gut, uh, potentially due to things like uh, high FODMAP intake, uh, and then excess production of histamine. Um, so that may be, again, one of the ways in which low FODMAP diet may help to improve symptoms. Uh, lastly, in terms of the results, I just want to focus on the fecalibacterium that was really low uh, to the point where it's not even detected. And again, that's a major butyrate producer. Um, interestingly, we know that butyrate from a number of studies can potentially inhibit mast cells. So that can be another reason why mast cells may be overactive in certain types of GI disorders. And you can see that here in this article titled, Butyrate Inhibits Mast Cell Activation uh, Through Epigenetics. Basically helps to um, uh, alter gene expression in immune cells, uh, especially the mast cells, so they're less reactive. And they go on to say here, short chain fatty acids are fermented dietary components that regulate immune responses, promote colon health, and suppress mast cell mediated diseases. And they go on to say in their conclusion that known health benefits of short chain fatty acids, especially butyrate and allergic disease can at least in part be explained by epigenic suppression of mast cell activa activation. 
Uh, so really looking at the big picture here in terms of the therapeutic implications, uh, in addition to considering addressing the organisms in dysbiosis that may be promoting activation of mast cells, if some of the key bacteria, normal bacteria are too low, that may be another factor that's uh, contributing to that imbalance uh, that increases mast cell activation. So again, as, as you can see, coming back to the overall case uh, summary, we did see that C. diff was detected, H. pylori was detected. Uh, we just touched on that briefly, that H. pylori is one of the organisms that may increase mast cell activation uh, in the stomach. So it might be a minor contributor in some cases, um, in this case in particular. Again, the normal bacteria section, we have the overgrowth, which often reflects uh, increased fermentation and gas production. So that may explain that part of the symptom picture, plus low fecalibacterium. Uh, and then again, that may lead to increased uh, scenario for mast cell activation that can then be further activated by opportunistic microbes, uh, especially the Morganella and the Staph aureus. So again, Staph aureus can stimulate mast cells based on what we know from research. Uh, Morganella probably plays a role in that by producing a histamine that's a known significant histamine producer. Uh, so again, we went through all the symptoms here and how what we're seeing on GI map may be related to symptoms in light of the, the research that's been emerging. Um, so this is really how our clinicians can get a lot of key information once you know this information and you're looking at the results of a test like GM map that gives you insights into the overall microbial e ecosystem, pathogens, opportunists, normal microbes, and then aspects of physiology, especially digestion and immune response, uh, and then connecting that to the patient's symptoms and again, what we know from uh, the emerging research can give you a lot of insights into key targets uh, that you may want to address as part of the symptom picture. So I just want to touch briefly here on treatment. Um, so we're running out of time here, so I'll have to kind of skip through this quickly, but feel free to ask some questions about treatments uh, in the Q&A. Um, this is a summary from the uh, mast cell activation syndrome uh, review article. Uh, listing some of the typical approaches in this mast cell activation type scenario. And this is specifically more for mast cell activation syndrome, uh, which overlaps with what's going on in the gut. Uh, but activation in the gut may not necessarily um, really uh, be defined by mast cell activation syndrome. There may be other types of mast cell activation in the gut. But certainly avoiding the triggers uh, can be important. Certainly the food triggers, if those can be identified, um, also, as we noted, stress can be a trigger. Uh, even heat and alcohol can be triggers, so important to avoid those. Uh, of course, low histamine diet, gluten-free diet can also be quite important as well. There's some evidence that, uh, especially in celiac disease, that mast cell activation plays a role there as well. Um, from a pharma pharmacological standpoint, uh, oftentimes uh, histamine receptor antagonists are often prescribed to help reduce symptoms. And certain flavonoids, I also noted those, such as quercetin and luteolin, may be helpful in reducing mast cell activation. Um, and then, of course, there are pharma pharmacological mast cell stabilizers. So lots of options from a few of the lifestyle and natural factors, uh, but also from conventional medicine. A few additional things here I just want to highlight real quick. Various lactic acid bacteria, so lactobacilli type probiotics, uh, can help counteract Staph aureus and also Pseudomonas. And those are thought to be key ways in a healthy gut uh, that keep Staph aureus and Pseudomonas in check. Um, also, apple cider vinegar, interestingly, has several studies showing that it can inhibit some of these key opportunists, especially Staph aureus. So that may be something to consider. Uh, in terms of the flavonoids, um, there's definitely quite a bit of research out there on how they affect pathogens and opportunists. And many of them have antibiofilm activity. Staph aureus is known to produce biofilms. Quercetin, again, is one of the key ones. Um, cinnamon extract is also a growing amount of research on that and how it can address some of these pathogens, biofilms, and may also uh, reduce the activity of the enzyme in some opportunists like Klebsiella that can result in histamine production. So lots of different ways to potentially address uh, this scenario. Um, and of course, standard antimicrobials, including things like berberine, et cetera, uh, often can be helpful as, as well. So thank you so much for listening, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over, and hopefully we have some time to uh, answer a few questions.
Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Fabian. Um, it is now time to move into our Q and a session as a reminder to everyone. If you have not already done, so please use the chat box to submit your questions. Um, and our 1st question is, uh, let's see, do any of these mast cell mediators show up on tests, uh, serotonin on organic acid test histamine on blood test. That's a great question. So. Testing for mast cell activation is kind of in its early stages in some way. <clears throat> Classically, especially in terms of mast cell activation, uh, a lot of that is done through blood testing. Uh, so looking for certain mediators like prostaglandin D2, excess histamine, uh, tryptase, et cetera. Uh, some of those approaches have been used. Um, there are a few complications with that. So again, I refer you back to the review articles that I noted for some of that detailed information. Um, but it's kind of a, we're at the early stages, so there really aren't yet a lot of great ways to definitively diagnose that there is mast cell activation in the gut. A lot of that has to be done through a combination of symptoms, uh, tests like GMAP, where you can see some of the potential triggers. Um, and especially if it's already established that there are certain issues like histamine intolerance that improve with reducing histamine related foods. Um, so you can start to get some clues there, but uh, definitely I think that's an area where uh, we look forward to better tests to confirm mast cell activation in the gut. Uh, but in the meantime, looking at the big picture with a stool test uh, certainly can give you some good clues as to whether or not that may be part of the picture. Thank you. And I believe we have time for one more question. Um, let's see. Uh, what role do mast cells have in food intolerances versus food allergies and sensitivities? That's a great question. So we talked a lot about um, food antigen triggered responses, which are the immune mediated responses of food allergies and sensitivities. Uh, we touched a little bit on the FODMAP scenario, which is more of a um, part of a picture of carbohydrate intolerance. So there's growing amount of evidence that carbohydrate intolerance can also be one of the factors that leads to IBS type symptoms. Um, we did see that one study that linked a lower FODMAP diet to also lower uh, histamine levels. Um, so certainly there are links there with carbohydrate intolerance, also histamine intolerance. Uh, those are probably the two best that are studied. Um, and there are several proposed mechanisms. Uh, interestingly, with carbohydrate intolerance in a sort of diarrhea dominant scenario, um, that's through uh, a type of diarrhea called osmotic diarrhea, typically. Uh, and it's been shown in some studies that that osmotic effect of the carbs going into the colon uh, from poor digestion, poor absorption can actually trigger histamine release that then may activate mast cells. So. Um, still a lot more study needs to be done to really define these more, but there are some clues that um, mast cells also can be activated by these other factors involved in food intolerances. Thank you. And it does look like that is all the time that we have for today's programs. And thank you again to Dr. Fabian for a great presentation today. And thank you to all of our attendees for taking the time out of your busy days to join us.